thank you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your kindness to us that we could gather together and sing these songs of praise to you. You are worthy of all praise, all ascribed glory. And we, such feeble creatures and so fickle of heart, are so often slow to render you the gratitude, the praise, the honor, the glory that you so deserve. We long for that day when our hearts will resonate with truth in ways we can't even comprehend yet. And in the meantime, Lord, let our hearts ring with the truths you have revealed in greater measure each day. We thank you for this letter that a sinner saved by grace wrote to a church that we have benefited from. And we thank you that we get to dig in again this morning into the glorious truths of your word. Help us now by your spirit to be soft-hearted, open-eared, eager for all you have said. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles one final time in this series to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16, beginning in verse 21. It was four years, one month, and 20 days ago that Scott Maxwell began this series and faithfully plied us through seven chapters of Romans. And now we are at 16. To say goodbye to the book of Romans feels like saying goodbye to an old friend. You just don't want it to end. If you've ever read a good book, got to the last paragraph and thought, oh, why is it over? At the same time, you recognize that if anything had been added, it would have taken away. To say goodbye to Romans, um, I hope does not mean saying goodbye in your heart. I hope you'll stay in touch. <laughs> Martin Luther said this of the letter to the Romans. Paul's letter to the Romans is the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel, which indeed deserves that a Christian should not only know it word for word by heart, but deal with it daily as with the daily bread of the soul. For it can never be read or considered too much or too well. And the more it is handled, the more delightful it becomes and the sweeter it tastes. Some of you I know have endeavored to memorize the entirety of this letter as it's being preached consecutively. I don't know how close you got or um, if you can get all the way through it in one shot. Um, but this has been an encouraging journey for us. A solidifying journey, an establishing journey. Just as Paul intended this letter to be an establishment of believers in Rome, so that Rome itself could be a waypoint for the gospel to progress beyond Rome, even so, that letter has served church after church after church in generation after generation throughout church history to that same end. May it do so even with us. What is this last passage? Look down with me at verse 21. We'll read to the end. Paul says this, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you, and so do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you, and Cordus, the brother. Now, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. Paul ends this letter to the Romans with final greetings and a final doxology. Final greetings and a final doxology. Those greetings occur in verses 21 to 23. There are eight greetings, one fellow worker, three countrymen, a secretary, a host, a city official, and a brother. 
These are people who are with Paul at Corinth as Paul writes the letter from Corinth to the churches at Rome. And so these people in Paul's immediate audience said, hey, tell the Roman believers I said hello. Who are they? Timothy, whom Paul here calls a fellow worker. In two letters to Timothy, Paul referred to him as my true child in the faith and my beloved son. There are the three countrymen, fellow Jews, that is Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater. Some of these might have reference to other characters, perhaps in Acts 17, or they might be same names, different people. There is the secretary, or a uh, technical name, the amanuensis, that is who actually put pen to paper and wrote this letter. When asked the question, who wrote Romans, you can say, Tertius. And you might fail the Bible quiz, but you'd be right. Uh, Tertius penned the letter. Um, if you were to answer, Paul wrote Romans, you'd be right. And if you were to say, God wrote Romans, you'd be rightest. So always safe. Say God wrote Romans. It's not the only time that Paul has used a secretary. Uh, some of Paul's letters end with, now I'm writing these last few words in my own hand, see the big letters. Right? It's possible, and some have surmised, that uh, from Tertius' statement in verse 22 afterwards, uh, the rest is handwritten by Paul. Uh, but Paul clearly, being borne along by the Holy Spirit, is recording accurately what God wants to say, being channeled through Paul's own personal experiences and writing style and personality through the pen, the physical pen of Tertius. Then the host, Gaius, greets him. This is probably the Gaius labeled in, in 1 Corinthians 1, where Paul says, I didn't baptize anybody in Corinth uh, except for Gaius. Um, it is Gaius who had a large home and likely hosted the entire church at Corinth in addition to extending hospitality to Paul. He greets the church at Rome. And then there's the city official, Erastus. Uh, he is labeled a, a steward, a financial steward for the city, which is sort of a middle management economics position. Uh, but there is an interesting uh, marble plate at Corinth with Erastus's name with a higher political position at Corinth that likely he achieved at another time. It's an interesting archaeological piece to someone actually named here in this letter. And then there is the brother, Cordus. Of course, every believer is a brother or sister in the Lord, but Cordus doesn't fit any of these other categories, and so he is brother. Tender affection, uh, fond affection for those in Christ. And it's interesting that Erastus and Cordus are together. One who is a high city official with much clout, uh, right after Gaius, who is obviously wealthy. You have Cordus, that is a low class name. And they're all together in the body of Christ, sending their greetings in this letter to the church at Rome. We have, after these final greetings, a final doxology. And this will take us a little more time this morning. Look down again, beginning at verse 25, now to him who is able, and then all the rest concludes with, to him be the glory. A doxology uh, from doxa, meaning light, it's the New Testament word for glory. This is glory ascribed. We understand that God is intrinsically glorious. He is the one who exists in inapproachable light. The bright, outshining radiance of the sum total of his combined attributes brilliantly blazes out of him because that's just who he is. That's one use of the sense of glory when it comes to God. But ascribed glory is when created beings recognize that intrinsic glory. God is glorious. And yet when we ascribe glory to him, we're not adding anything to his intrinsic nature, anything to his character or his attributes or his radiance or his brilliance. We are simply ascribing to him what is true of him. We are saying, yes, ascribed glory is something like fame or applause. Those are silly words to describe what it means to glorify God. But it is we recognizing and saying, singing, living, acting, thinking, feeling in such a way that it is a recognition and a reflection of God's glory. This isn't the first doxology in the book of Romans. You remember in chapter 1, verse 25, Paul is describing the Gentile world going after idols. And they worship and serve the created things rather than the creator, who is forever praised, amen. He just like busts into song 
in the middle of a discussion of idolatry because the one true God must get all glory. And then, of course, there is another doxology in the book of Romans in that climactic section at the end of chapter 11. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Nobody's been his counselor. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory. Amen. And then there is this doxology. To him who is able. And this doxology uh, ascribes glory in sort of three phases. There is the object of glory, the means of glory, and the duration of glory. The object of glory is to him who is able and to the only wise God. The means of glory is through Jesus Christ. And the duration of glory is forever. That is the sort of skeleton outline of this doxology. But we're going to look in more detail in verses 25 and 26 where the bulk of the words happen at this one who is to receive glory. Who is he? What has he done? This one that we are to ascribe glory to. And notice in verse 25, now to him who is able, and we get this long string that takes us from verses 25 to 26. God who is able to do what? To establish you. To establish you, that is to make you strong to make you stand firm, to establish you, he says, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, and according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past but is now manifested, and to that God who has made known to all the nations. This whole string of things all comes under this banner of God who is able. And let's just start right there. God is the one who is able, that is powerful, to establish you or to cause you to be firm. It was God's power that the Roman believers are even established in the gospel. It was by God's doing that Roman believers believed the gospel and were being strengthened in the gospel. It was God's power that people believed. It's God's power that people remain faithful. And we see on display here God's power... Through human means. What were the human means of Roman believers believing and being established in the gospel? Well, the preaching of the gospel, either by people from Rome who had been at Jerusalem and heard it from the apostles, or by those who believed and traveled and made their way to Rome. People had believed the gospel by God's power through human means. Some had heard of it and known of it through Paul's preaching. And now believers are being established in that gospel, even by Paul's writing of this letter. Paul's future visit to Rome, he indicates in Romans 1.11, he says, I long to see you so that you may be established. Same word there. The preaching of God's word was to build up the church. It, It takes God's power. And God's power working through human means for the gospel to be known to your kids in your home. It is God's power that must be at work in evangelism in the workplace. It is God's power that must take place in the admonishing and encouraging and building one another up in the church. All of these involve human means, and yet all of them demand God's power. Without God's power, He is the one who is able to establish you. Without that, none of those things happen. Human endeavors Human means spin their wheels to no avail. This is why over and over again in Paul's prayers, he thanks God that believers believe. You ever wonder about that? I thank my God continually in my prayers when I remember your faith. Wait, shouldn't you be thanking the people for their faith when you remember their faith? No, Paul gives God credit for the faith response of believers when they believe. Why? Because without God's supernatural working at the heart level, by the power of the Holy Spirit, nobody believes. Now, the God who is able, that is powerful, to establish you, to cause you to be firm. Uh, This doxology is reminiscent of the doxology in Jude 24, to God who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of His glory, blameless with great joy. What does Paul mean here by being established? Established in what? Uh, Standing firm and resolute 
according to what standard? What is he getting at here in Romans 16? You see, you can be firm and established in a lot of things. You can say, I will not eat green eggs and ham. I will not eat them, Sam I am. Or as of last week, you can make the commitment, I will not read Dr. Seuss's books. I will not give them second looks. I mean, you could do, <laughs> be really firm in anything. I unintentionally super glued my fingers together last night. Resolute, firm, established. Not what I was going for. You can build a fortress for yourself around bad ideas, around personal preferences, around self-destructive habits. You can make those things firm and resolute and established. And resolute firmness can just be plain, simple, selfish stubbornness. What is the standard that Paul has in mind when he talks about being established by the power of God? How does Paul want Christians to be firmly established? Notice what he says in verse 25, according to my gospel and to the preaching of Jesus Christ. These twin ideas tell us the standard that Paul has in mind. The gospel of God that Paul has articulated in this very letter. His gospel that resonates with the gospel of the apostles and specific to Paul's ministry is expressed to the nations as he goes out from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the Gentile world. And he says, according to the preaching of Jesus Christ, that is, uh, not the preaching that Jesus did, uh, the, Jesus' sermons are, are part of Scripture and they're important, but what Paul means here is the proclaiming of Jesus the Christ, the proclamation of the good news that is about Jesus the Messiah. And, and these twin statements of the standard by which we are being established, uh, these are parallel and they go together and they're nearly synonymous ways for Paul to stress that the standard of our establishment is in the good news of the message preached about Jesus Christ, the Savior of all who would believe in Him. It is the gospel. And Paul has another standard in mind in this text that is slightly different. It's found in the next phrase. Notice what he says. According to the revelation of the mystery. The revelation of the mystery. The words revelation and mystery are ideas that correlate with one another. Mysteries are to be revealed. That which is revealed, which wasn't re revealed before, was a mystery before it was revealed. And when we see the word mystery, sometimes we think of the mystery machine or we think of a mystery novel, right, where you're working hard to figure out from the clues what the secret thing is that the author's trying to lead you to but not lead you to too well. That's not how Paul is using mystery. That's not how the Bible uses the word mystery. Mystery in your Bible is simply something concealed by God but now revealed by God. Something that was once concealed, but now revealed. That's mystery. It's not a reference to something hard to understand in the Bible. Boy, it's, you know, the mysteries of the Bible are how to pronounce all these ites in the conquest of Palestine. That's not what he means by mystery. Or, I don't really understand the referent of this pronoun. Or, it's not hermeneutical mysteries because we haven't finished studying. Right? That's not the idea of mystery. <clears throat> By the way, some people relegate some things in their Bible that are clearly proclaimed in Scripture as mystery, either because they haven't studied hard enough or they don't want to believe what it plainly says. And those things are plain and clear enough on their own, and some people understand them, and some people cry, mystery. That's not what's at stake here. A mystery is a reference to something not revealed at some point in God's revelatory history that subsequently gets revealed, not by a sleuth figuring out the clues, but by God Himself in self-disclosure through His revelation. When the New Testament speaks of mystery, it's not an invitation for us to go and solve it. In New Testament, the mystery, the word mystery refers either to something that the Old Testament did not reveal, but God has revealed it in the New Testament, or something that the New Testament declares to be a mystery and is still not yet revealed, but will be one day. Let me give you some examples. The mystery of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. What is that? Who is it? What's his name? Where was he born? 
It's a mystery. That means it's concealed, not revealed yet. Um, the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3.16 that then Paul explains about Christ. The mystery of the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15.51. These are examples of the way the New Testament uses the word mystery. But the overwhelming use of mystery in the New Testament has to do with Jew-Gentile relationships in the church. The mystery that Paul most often refers to is the fact that Jews and Gentiles are together in one body, one organism called the church that was not spoken of in the Old Testament. Jew-Gentile together in one body as the vehicle by which good news about Messiah would go to the ends of the earth, that's new. Once concealed, now revealed. That is the overwhelming use of the word mystery in the New Testament. The church, Jew-Gentile together in one organism as the vehicle for gospel expansion. Listen to Paul's words in Ephesians 3, verses 3 to 6. By revelation, there was made known to me the mystery. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, Paul says, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Do you understand? When Paul's using mystery here, he's not saying, I'm going to tell you something mysterious and you can't know what it is. <laughs> he's telling you God has hidden something and now he's revealed it and I am telling you what it is. And what is that thing <laughs> in Paul? Jew, Gentile together in one body the church as the vehicle for the expansion of the gospel to the ends of the earth. And notice what Paul says about it here in this doxology in Romans 16. It has been kept secret for long ages past. It has been kept secret for long ages past. You can't go to the Old Testament and find the verse that says, there will be Jew and Gentile together in one body called the church, born at Acts 2, that takes the gospel to the ends of the earth. That, that verse isn't in your Old Testament. And this is critical to understand what the mystery is not, right? Sometimes if we just sort of read this at the surface level, we go, yes, Jesus died on the cross. That was the mystery, and now we know it, and it makes sense of the Old Testament. That's not what he's talking about at all. The mystery is not substitutionary atonement. Look, we've got substitutionary atonement from Genesis 3. We've got animals dying in the place of sinners, and their skins used as covering over sin and shame. We've got substitutionary atonement all the way through the sacrificial system under Mosaic law that indicated innocent something had to die in the place of guilty someone. The mystery is not righteousness by faith. We get that in Genesis 12 with Abraham. He was an idolater in Ur of the Chaldees. He worshiped the wrong gods. He had the wrong practices. He had no business with God. He wasn't seeking God. God said, you're mine. I'm calling you. Follow me. And Abraham believed, and it was what? Credited to him as righteousness. Right? The righteousness of God is not new, something concealed in the Old Testament, but actually demanded by God and provided for by God through the vehicle of faith. Abraham's the classic example. Any who believed in the Old Testament are the example of that. Gentile blessing in the plan of God is not new. It was not mysterious in the Old Testament. By the way, Abraham, was he Jew or Gentile? Yeah, kind of both. <laughs> and Genesis 12 makes very clear that the blessings that would come through him and his progeny would bless the nations. And throughout the Old Testament are peppered these promises of blessing to the nations. Isaiah 25 is a very clear example of an eternal state promise where people from every nation would surround the banquet table of Yahweh and say, this is our God. Right? Deflating the concept that Yahweh was somehow a regional deity for Israel and all the pagan nations were left to pursue their own things and all spokes are on a wheel of a wagon. They all lead to the same place. We all get to heaven if we worship our God sincerely. That's garbage. There's only one true God. And the one true God would bless the nations through Abraham and his progeny. That was promised all the way back in Genesis 12. We haven't left the first 10 pages of your Bible and these things are all there. That's not the mystery. The mystery is not Messiah as a suffering servant 
who would die a death, a death even described as crucifixion. His burial, His resurrection, His ascension, His return, and His reign on the earth, all of these things were clearly promised in the Old Testament. They're not the mystery. So what was it that was secreted for ages past but is now made known? (laughs) Look at the next verse, verse 26. But now is manifested, brought forward, brought out, And then the next phrase is perhaps a little bit difficult in the New American Standard. Uh, My Bible says, and by the scriptures of the prophets. Um, It's it's a little misleading there. The original just says, uh, having now been manifested through the prophetic writings. Having now been manifested through the prophetic writings. Uh, This is an important phrase for us to understand. Um, If we take this as a reference to the Old Testament then Paul is saying in one sentence, there's a bunch of stuff concealed, but now it's being revealed by the Old Testament. That's not his point. Uh, His point is that the, the prophetic writings, in other words, apostolic teaching, the New Testament is what is bringing out the revealing of what had previously been concealed. This is not that the New Testament becomes a decoder ring to hidden secret furtive mysteries in the Old Testament that now you can read New Testament back in the... That's not it. It's that God is giving new revelation. He hid some things that were always in His plan and He's brought them out now. And to see this as a reference to New Testament is not difficult, I think, when we uh, wrestle with what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16 when he says all Scripture is breathed out by God. He started out by saying the sacred writings, the Old Testament, and the things you've heard from me. In other words, Pauline teaching. And then he sums them all up and says all Scripture. In other words, Old Testament prophetic writing and New Testament prophetic writing on the same plane, together, being put forward as God's word, not contradicting one another, complementary to one another. Second Peter 1.20 calls this the prophetic word, speaking about New Testament revelation. And what is it that's revealed in the New Testament um, that is new or was concealed in Old Testament era? Listen to Ephesians 3.5 again. In other generations, it was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to His holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. See, what God is doing so kindly in His Holy Spirit, in that first generation of the church, He has raised up apostles and prophets. Ephesians 2.20 calls them the foundation of the church. That is, the, the teachings that become the documents of the New Testament tell us what God is doing in our era. And what is it that was concealed and now revealed? Jew, Gentile together in one body, the church, as the vehicle for the expansion of the gospel of Israel's Messiah to the nations, to the ends of the earth. And notice what Paul says about this. This is done according to the commandment of the eternal God. He said, well, who sets the standard for doing all these things? God did. God said this. God publishes this. By His Holy Spirit, through the apostles, through the New Testament prophets, right on par with the Old Testament writers. This was God's purpose, and so He commanded. Notice what Paul says about this God. According to the commandment of the eternal God. That is the God who was and is and is to come. The God who never changes. The eternal God who has eternal purposes. Right? If we're tempted to think that a change in God's operating in our world means a change in his character or a change in his plans or a change in his purpose or a change in his promises, we have misunderstood. All of these things come out of the eternal plan, the eternal purpose, the before the foundation of the world decrees of an eternal God. And they are unfolding for us in time. Similarly to the way you live your life, you don't live all 87 years of your life in one moment, but you live them progressively, moment by moment. God is dealing with His people in this way. 
Think about what it means that the command of God would mean that Jew, Gentile together in one body, the church, would be taking the gospel of Messiah to the ends of the earth. Uh, This had to come by the command of God because no Jew wanted to do this and no Gentile thought it possible. You go back to the first century, this was the right command in time at the right time from God who could command such things. Think about a Damascus road and what Jesus did with Saul who became the Apostle Paul. Floored him, humbled him, brought him to the end of himself. Jesus made Paul his own and made him a special vessel, said, I'm going to use you, Paul, and you're going to suffer. And then Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Think about what it meant for Peter. Uh, Peter had to wrestle with these things over and over and over again. Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean, and here comes this sheet full of pork chops and bacon. (laughs) No, 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 I'm not going to touch that. Eat it, Peter. I've made it clean. And then he meets a Gentile. Oh, I I didn't want to be around those guys. They were dirty. They were outsiders. They, They didn't belong with me. I was better than them, chosen, special. And now I have to be around them. And Peter was humbled in that, not just once, but multiple times. Do you remember when the Judaizers came in and pressured even the apostle Peter to succumb to their pressure to be exclusionary around Gentiles, refusing them table fellowship? And Paul had to confront him to his face. Look, this was hard for Jews to get in line with this vehicle that was going to take Israel's Messiah to the ends of the earth. You mean I got to let Gentiles in the car? And if I were to look forward through church history, it's going to be a lot of Gentile cars with a lot of Gentiles driving. And this was God's plan. It was hard. The older commission, by the way, for Israel, if we want to think of a great commission for Israel, was you be Israel... You be unique and peculiar in the world, and you stay in the land. Cultivate faithfulness there, and I will bless you. And what was the world's response supposed to be there? They will see that you're peculiar, that what you eat is different, what you wear is different, how you plow your fields is different, so that every turn at every point in your life, you say, we belong to Yahweh, we're a peculiar people. Of course, they failed in their commission, and the watching world should have said, Israel's God is the one true God. We're going there. The world should have streamed into Jerusalem and worshipped Yahweh. But instead, the Gentiles blasphemed God because of Israel's hypocrisy and spiritual vacuousness. They failed at their commission. There is a newer commission, and it is not that you are to stay in the land, stay right there where the temple is, And the nations will stream in and hear about Yahweh and worship Him. Now, you're a temple. You, individual believer in Jesus Christ, you're a temple. And y'all are a temple, church. And you scatter to the ends of the earth. You don't stay there and be faithful. You go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You'll be my witnesses. And you take the gospel of Israel's Messiah to every nation, so that the throne of Messiah will be surrounded by a people from every tongue and tribe and nation. That's the newer commission. This was different. This was hard. In fact, when you think about the progression, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, and you trace that through the book of Acts, thousands of people, new believers in Jerusalem, and they're all staying there. Uh, Persecution came. And scattered them. When I lived in East Tennessee, we had wolf spiders. Uh, They were big. I discovered why they were called wolf spiders. Because they're scary, hairy, large predators in the house. The problem is when you step on a mama wolf spider, what you don't know is that fuzz on the top of her back is actually hundreds of little baby wolf spiders. And you step and they scatter and then you've got, I don't know how many, too many. Wolf spiders all over the house and every nook and cranny. And that's what persecution did in the church in Jerusalem. Stepped on the church and the church scattered. And what God said would happen, that they would be his witnesses in concentric circles outwards. 
has happened and is still happening today. It's not finished. And so Paul says this has been made known. This commandment of God has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith. Gospel surrender. Belief in Jesus Christ, obedience to the obligations of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in the gospel. There are bookends to this letter. The opening paragraph and the closing paragraph have some really remarkable similarities in this letter. In chapter 1, verse 5, we see that same phrase, unto the obedience of faith, that we just saw in verse 26 of chapter 16. In verse 26, we also see unto all the nations. In chapter 1, verse 5, it was in all the nations. And here in verse 26, we notice this was by the command of God. And in Romans 1, 1, Paul calls himself a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. That is, God set Paul apart for the gospel. God's command is what brought all this about. We just looked in verse 26 that this making known what had been secreted for the ages comes through the prophetic writings of the New Testament. And back in chapter 1, God said He promised the gospel beforehand through His prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Very similar phraseology describing what God said He would do from the Old Testament, bookended to what God says He has done in the writing of the New Testament. By the way, Paul's letter to the Romans even fits under that category of God's revelatory work bringing about these truths. And so the things promised now revealed, some things that were concealed are now made known, and we have the bookends to this letter, what God said He would do in the Old Testament, and now what God is doing in the unfolding of the new. In the publication of the good news of Israel's Messiah for the salvation of the Gentiles. And what do we have in between those bookends? This amazing letter. This clear articulation of the amazing grace of God towards sinners in His master plan to get a people for His own possession from every nation. And Paul has written this to get the Roman believers on his side, energized to see the gospel, not only establish them as a church, but to go through them and beyond them in the building and establishing of churches beyond. What did Paul say in chapter 1, verse 16? I am not ashamed of the gospel. There is shame for us if we turn away from this great message. Paul says, I'm not ashamed. And he goes on in chapter 1 to say why he's not ashamed, because in it, that is, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is made known. Well, why do we need the righteousness of God? Well, because of 117. For the wrath of God is being made known against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And what Paul unfolds in chapter 1 is the downward spiral of the total and collective depravity of the Gentile world. All those Gentiles are terrible people doing terrible things, and the wrath of God abides on them. And then he moves to chapter 2. And then the Jewish nation is in the crosshairs. They are hypocrites, thinking they're right before God, doing terrible things because they're terrible people in need of a Savior. They need God's righteousness, and they don't have it. They think that they're building a righteousness of their own, and they're rejecting the righteousness God provides for free in Christ. So in chapter 3, in case we didn't do the math and figure out that all the Gentiles are sinners in chapter 1 and all the Jews are sinners in chapter 2, and that means everybody, Paul says in chapter 3, everyone's a sinner. There is no one who does good, not even one. All have turned away. Together they have become corrupt. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. There is no one who does good. No one seeking after God. And a tirade on God's assessment of the human condition. Everybody's a sinner. And in chapter 3, verse 21 Paul begins to unfold the solution to the problem. The problem of God, the problem of us. How does that get solved? How does a sinner 
overcome the perfect, absolute demand of God's righteousness and get forgiven, and yet God still be righteous. How does that happen? Only one way. Redemption through the gift of the grace that comes by the death of Jesus Christ, what Paul calls there a propitiation through faith in his blood. It's the only way. That divine wrath would be satisfied by a substitute in our place. And that is appropriated by sinners only through faith. Not works of the law. Not only so that no one can boast, but also because it's impossible. You can't work your way out of the mess that you got yourself into. You can't undo the crimes that you've done. Even if you stopped sinning somehow, which you can't because you're a sinner by nature, if you could somehow stop sinning, all those crimes you already did are already on your record. You cannot clean yourself up before God. The only hope is a a propitiatory sacrifice. That is, Jesus dies in your place. It's the gospel. Chapter 4 gives us the example of Abraham as one who believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Always been true. Always only one way of salvation. You believe God's provision for sin. You believe God's provision of righteousness. It comes only and always and ever only by faith. Abraham believed God. He's the prototypical example of the one whom God says in verse 5 of chapter 4, God justifies the wicked. That is, God declares righteous the ungodly. Not those who have cleaned themselves up, fixed their own problems. Chapter 5, of course, gives us the fruits of justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We possess peace with God. A cessation of hostilities, of our antagonism against God by nature, and God's wrath abiding on us from heaven. Having been declared righteous... We possess peace with God in an ongoing, continuous way. The other fruits of justification in chapter 5 are perseverance and proven character and God's love by the Holy Spirit shed abroad in our hearts of a solidarity with Christ instead of a solidarity with Adam and of sinful humanity. And finally, of the reign of grace. Just as sin reigned in death, so also grace shall reign through righteousness into eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now the reign of grace defines the Christian life. It gives us a new relationship to sin in chapter 6 and a new relationship to law in chapter 7 and a new relationship to God by the Holy Spirit in chapter 8. The Holy Spirit that cries out in our hearts with our spirits, Abba, Father, Daddy, my tender personal relationship to this awful, almighty, holy God because he has adopted me in love. Staggering. Staggering fruits of justification. And of course, Romans 8 gives us those remarkable absolute statements for all who are in Christ. No condemnation and no separation. Everyone whom God has justified, who can condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, yes, rather was raised from the dead. Nobody can be separated from the love of God who is attached to Jesus Christ. No supernatural power, no circumstance, no sin can separate us from his love. And that brings us to chapters 9 to 11, which is the problem of the unbelief of the nation of Israel. Right? It's what we should be saying. We should be protesting what Paul says in Romans 9 to 11 after we've read Romans 1 to 8. Oh, these great and precious, wonderful promises, declaration of righteousness and guarantee of heaven and no condemnation and no separation. But wait a second, Israel's condemned and separated. God made promises to them. What's the problem? Romans 9, 6 is not as though the word of God has failed, dot, 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 has it? No, let God be true and every man a liar. God will keep his promises and every human will be humbled by it. So what is the deal? What's the deal with Israel? This was her Messiah and she murdered Messiah as a nation and rejected Messiah as a nation. And Paul explains that God's word has not, has not failed in his specific promises to Israel for three reasons in Romans 9 to 11. The first reason is simply that not all Israel is Israel. There are spiritual Jews and there are merely physical ones. Merely physical Jews can trace lineage. 
spiritual Jews have lineage and new birth. They have spiritual life brought about by the Holy Spirit. That's what a spiritual Jew is. A spiritual Jew is not a Gentile pretending to be a Jew. A spiritual Jew is a Jew with the Spirit. And so God's word hasn't failed because he, he differentiates between promises given to a, a, a nation being fulfilled in the spiritual regeneration of participants in that nation. And it's the way he's always worked. The second proof that God doesn't fail in his word is that he always keeps a remnant. Generation to generation, there have been faithful Jews. And then the third reason Paul says that God's word hasn't failed is because there is coming a day, there is coming a generation, Romans eleven twenty seven, 27, when all Israel will be saved. And they will not be saved apart from regeneration. It's not as if God keeps his promises to apostate, hypocritical, spiritually dead Israel and leaves them in that state. No, he brings them right through the same gospel that saved us. They will look on him, Zechariah 12, 10, whom they crucified, whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him as for an only son. That day's coming. So God's word doesn't fail. And look, the Romans 8 promises to us Gentile believers are at stake in whether or not God keeps his promises to Israel. It matters. It's a gospel issue. It's a God's integrity issue that God keeps his promises. And so Paul paints the wonderful picture, and we need to see this picture of that olive tree. Gentiles, we grew up in the wild olive groves. We were crazy looking olive trees, uncultivated, unpruned, unkept, unwatered, scraggly, unfruitful, outsiders, not in the garden. And there were branches lopped off from the cultivated, gardened olive tree, which was Israel. They were lopped off for their unbelief, and there they are, dead branches on the ground. And you Gentiles who believe were graciously grafted in to that rich root, which was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promises made to Israel, and you get to have Israel's Messiah? It's too good to be true. And Gentiles at the end of that say, what am I doing here? I don't belong. I was a scraggly wild olive, and now I'm grafted into the rich root. Is this even possible? God, it's mercy, undeserved favor. And the dead branches lopped off on the ground that have Israelite heritage. You know what they used to say? Oh, we have Abraham as our father. They don't say that anymore. They don't believe that they're in by heredity or by dragging on the coattails of their parents or the promises to the patriarchs. If they believe, they believe by faith because they recognize that they are sinners. Like Paul himself said, I am the chief sinner. When he used to say, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And any Jew that believes the gospel and gets into the church is placed there by God's grace and His mercy, not because of what they deserve, so that every Jew in heaven will say, I don't belong here. This is all of mercy and all of grace, so that this tree, Jew and Gentile together in it, benefiting from the promises God made through Abraham, will all say forever, mercy, 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 all of grace. And that is exactly how Paul bursts out in chapter 11. He says, The depth and the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. Nobody would have come up with this plan. Nobody can tell God what to do. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become His counselor? Or who has first given to God that it might be repaid? God will be debtor to no one. He will be the gracious giver to all who believe. For from him, verse 36, and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That is the gospel in this book. And of course, the very next verse takes us to the implications of it. Therefore, the great big hinge in Romans 12.1, I urge you, brethren, in view of these mercies, Present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to Him. And we learn our obligations to the Lord and to one another in the body of Christ. It becomes the manual for Christian living for us. In chapter 12, the, the one another love. In chapter 13, our new relationship to human government. In chapter 14 and 15, living with and loving one another in our diversity of preferences. And then in chapter 16, greetings and then warnings and then greetings and then glory. It's the letter. 
And in this final doxology Paul closes the letter with, we have the object of ascribed glory. To him who is able to establish you and to the only wise God. Then we have the means of glory. God will get all this glory through the means of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have the duration of the glory stated again, forever. Eternity will not bring us to the end of ascribing God glory for his grace towards sinners. We'll sing about it now, and we'll sing forever. Let's pray. God, thank you for this magnificent letter, which is an explanation of your magnificent gospel, which strengthens and establishes us by your power, according to your standards. God, we pray that that gospel establishment would not end here like some cul-de-sac, but would be a thoroughfare for the gospel going in the lives and on the lips of saved sinners as trophies of your grace, as ambassadors of your saving work and your coming kingdom, that we might preach this gospel to everything that moves and to every nation. We ask it for your glory forever and ever. Amen.